Hello, my name is Professor Lynn Coventry from Northumbria University. Today I would like to introduce you to the Secure Behaviour Nudging Toolkit. The aim of the toolkit is to provide tools to identify ways in which staffs work around cybersecurity, the underlying reasons for the adoption of these workarounds, ways to change these behaviours if the workaround reduces cybersecurity, and way to, ways to evaluate if that nudge has been successful. Firstly, it is important to acknowledge that employee behaviour can undermine any technical security controls. Attackers are well aware of this, and rather than spending hours trying to break through the technology defences, they are targeting users to let them in. You might ask yourself why there is a problem when the security policy tells employees how they are expected to behave. Unfortunately, just because staff know what they should do doesn't mean they will. I have mentioned nudging. Nudging is a way to encourage people to behave in a certain way through changes to the environment in which the behaviour is expected. Good nudges are timely, that is, they are delivered at a time when a person should be enacting that behaviour. Nudges may look simple, but they have been shown to be effective. For example, a pair of eyes watching you can lead to more honest behaviour. A red or green card can incentivise clear desk behaviour and a proximity detector which flashes and vibrates can remind you to log out. So what is a secure behaviour nudging toolkit? It is a set of tools that help an organisation to identify and prioritise the insecure behaviours occurring in their workplace, identify how and why these behaviours occur, identify and design appropriate interventions including nudges and evaluate these interventions effectiveness on an ongoing basis. Our toolkit contains six tools which help people to implement a process of continual behavioural improvement. The first tool is to identify the underlying attitude towards cyber security. This is a survey which covers different attitudes and also assesses access to different devices and data. The second tool outlines an approach to identify workarounds of current policies. This is a series of questions to form part of a discussion group. Firstly, looking at the behaviours in the workplace and secondly, specifically asking about the importance and achievability of each behaviour listed in the security policy. Where achievability is low, then the workaround used for this behaviour can be explored within the workshop. From these tools, the behaviours can then be prioritised and we can start to look at how each prioritised behaviour is being influenced. This tool, for instance, allows an organisation to list the behaviours expected from staff on yellow stickies as listed in their policies. These can be assessed for importance and also achievability. As the staff work together to rate how achievable they think a behaviour is, they can start to explain the barriers to that behaviour and how they work around it. The use of this tool can be complemented with workshops discussing the behaviours in the workplace and asking how a task is typically comp completed and also with observations of behaviours in the workplace. The next stage is to prioritise the most risky behaviours and identify the most suitable intervention for each of these behaviours. Once a behaviour has been identified, then we can work with staff to understand more about how that behaviour has come about. Just say from this, we prioritise sharing passwords with colleagues as a behaviour that is carried out and discuss when asked about the policy, do not share passwords. Now we can look at the influences of that behaviour. This can be carried out in a workshop by presenting participants with cards of influencers gathered from theories of behaviour and asking if they occur in the workplace. Here are some examples of the influencers of password sharing. You can see that there is a positive attitude towards this behaviour and people do not think they have the authority to change this in the workplace. Rather, they feel it is expected of them from senior staff and that it is a common behaviour. The next step is to look at how to influence the behaviour to change and how it can be nudged. Firstly, the team should work together to identify as many nudges as possible. Then the nudges should be evaluated to decide on the most feasible and potentially effective before developing and evaluating a prototype nudge. 
The tool we use for this is nicknamed Mindspace. This tool pulls together many different influencers from different theories. It provides another way to frame questions to explore the problem space. So for example, if we were trying to improve the strength of passwords, there are a number of ways that could try to nudge that behavior. So for example, we could use a password strength meter, which shows how, a strong, password, how strong a password is as it, it is created or entered. Once the team have identified a list of potential nudges, we provide worksheets to help decide which nudge to develop. This includes guiding the user through evaluation of potential nudges based on some factors. These are the following, these are the criteria we have currently included. Technological feasibility, time and ease of implementation, disruption to work processes, whether or not a policy change is required, the financial cost of developing the nudge, the expected effectiveness of the nudge, how sustainable and generalizable the nudge is. Here are three nudges that we have designed using the toolkit and which were piloted across three health organizations. A poster campaign to raise awareness of the need to log out when le leaving a workstation, badges to increase social awareness of who is conforming or not, and a bit of humor to include increase the salience of the danger of using USBs without disabling them. The last step is to pilot, then roll out the nudge and evaluate if it is successful. Ideally, the behavior would be measured directly, but this is not always possible and we may need to rely on observation and self-reporting. It is important to run a pilot before full development of an intervention to ensure the nudge doesn't backfire. This does not need exact metrics, but involves a qualitative evaluation of whether or not the nudges would work and if people would find them acceptable. Take our badges example. In the workshop, people thought disincentives would be a good idea, but when we initially prototyped the badges and sent them out for review, there were, was some initial pushback and fear that people would not accept the negative framing. Lastly, it is important to treat nudge development as a cyclic process where the effectiveness needs to be continually assessed and new nudges developed as necessary.